Well, hello to our uh, live stream viewers and listeners. It's nice to have you here. Uh, this is the, um, you know, bonus off the top of uh, Canada Reads. Welcome back to uh, another edition. 2022 is, uh, is, uh, is, is in force. Now, this is the part where people tune in and either they're like, this is great, or they're like, very disappointed. <laughs> because they're like, nobody's talking. Everyone's That's in right. their book and reading and getting focused. Uh, but if you're a live stream listener, you're used to that. People are just sort of doing their own thing for the next uh, four or five minutes or so until we start the, um, the uh, broadcast. So, uh, you know, no, no pressure on anyone to uh, get up and do a jig or anything. The expectations <laughs> are low. But we were talking about um, new... Toronto, uh, you know, new, new Toronto visitors, and Malia and Suzanne, you are both, this is your first time? Tarek, you've been here before? I've been here many times. Many so. times, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure, maybe, and I'm going to put this out there for our web audience, you know, you're connected to nature. I assume you're just living in Vancouver. You're more connected yeah. to the mountains. Maybe people can write in and uh, talk about where to find good nature in Toronto. I, I certainly can. can't. I'm not the guy for that. Trinity, Trinity Bellwoods Park, maybe. That's yeah. very funny. Uh, <laughs> Trinity Bellwoods is also a place where there's just a lot of, you know, smoking of weed and like, uh, well, I mean, you know, True. various illegal activities. And uh, it's small. I'm, I'm thinking about the woods. I'm thinking yeah. about a forest for Suzanne. I saw some beautiful trees coming in. Oh, did that's you? great. I did. Well, I mean, with no out leaves, but the beautiful branches and the... The geometry of them with the with Lake Ontario against the background, I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. You know what? This is an ecologist oh talking. This is an ecologist talking. I have to I say, I miss trees so much. I was in Dubai for a week, mm. oh, wow. and all the trees there are fake. So, yeah. oh, oh my God, like, I appreciate it so much being in Nova Scotia. There are trees there, <laughs> literally, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, so jammed on the highway, and you don't see people, you know, you only see trees. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. You drive two hours. In Dubai, I found that a, a tree is like an enemy because they're oh, like, we dude. could build something here. That's right. <laughs> like in our way. Competing with that concrete jungle there. Maz Jobrani, <laughs> I don't know if you know Maz Jobrani, he's a comedian, Maz, a yeah. Persian guy from LA. This was one of his jokes. He's like, every. Every year you go back and you can't recognize anything because you're like, that's right. This used to be a parking lot. Well, it's your hotel now, sir. Like, and that's the speed with which everything is uh, mm. going up, you know. And it's crazy. Yeah. Sort of, every time I arrive, people think I'm an Uber driver and just like, you know, it's all, <laughs> it's all so much big money. You can't compete. <laughs> what were you doing in Dubai? Uh, we were doing the movie viewing. Our movie viewing with the Canadian Embassy. Okay. Yeah. The movie is a Expo. documentary. Is no, it's not a documentary. It's based on our story. Okay. So we were showing it first time in the Middle East. Okay. And we had really a blast time. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was great. It was like 31 degrees. So. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That was recently. Yeah. It was. Yeah. That was last week. Yeah. Okay. So I had to go back to Nova Scotia, change all my outfits, and then bring gold. <laughs> <laughs> change all my outfits. I literally came to Toronto with that with a T-shirt. I'm wow. like, now what did I do? <laughs> it was like my. <laughs> Minus two when I got here. That was really bad. Yeah. Did you guys do much traveling during COVID? Did you stay, stay I home? was a twice a week traveler between Calgary and Toronto in my regular life. Oh, I really? Wow. travel 130,000 kilometers on Air Canada in economy a year. <laughs> and so I stopped completely and I just love it. I, like oh I've been God. home for two years. I won't ever go back that. I'll, I'll start to travel again, but never like that. Did you have to schedule. build an Air Canada seat in your home just to feel comfortable? <laughs> People say, where do you live? And yeah. I would say Air Canada. Yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. kind of <laughs> half a joke. Yeah. Yeah, I used to have a place here in Toronto that I let go during the pandemic. And nice to be consolidated all in one home and one place. Calgary, Toronto twice a week is a lot. It was a lot. That's that four-hour trip is, yeah. ugh, it's even worse yeah. than Vancouver. That extra hour is just like, oh, wait till you fly home. You'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. So we have one minute to the, um, but, but say that again. 15 seconds in our chat and then we're quiet. Right. Perfect. Our poor podcast. Hey guys, <laughs> sorry we're so nervous and just getting ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quiet please. 30 seconds to air. Have a great show, everybody.
This is a CBC special presentation, available in described video. What is the one book that all of Canada should read? That is what you are here to find out. Five prominent Canadians are here with me. Each of them has chosen the one book that they think the entire country should read. And this year, we're looking for one book to connect us. Which one will it be? It's the Great Canadian Book Debate. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. Well, hello and welcome. It's the 21st edition of Canada Reads and the third pandemic edition. We're still following COVID protocols here. There's no live studio audience. And we may still be six feet apart, but we are coming together to talk books. And doing that with me is your esteemed panel. We have an Olympian, a fashion journalist, an actor, an ecologist, and an entrepreneur. They are all readers, and they're here to choose the one book all of Canada should read. It is a big job, but they're up for the challenge. Let's meet them now. <laughs> On my left is your first panelist, and he knows what it takes to be a champion. He's a swimmer from Calgary who won an Olympic gold medal in 1992. Since then, he's gone on to be a successful speaker, writer, and TV host. Welcome to Canada Reads, Mark Tewksbury. Thank you, Ali. All right, well, hello, and how are you? I'm great, I'm so excited to be here. I've had just a blast getting ready for this competition. I didn't, uh, I haven't done a project like this since I was in university, so it was really fun to go through books. We're and, happy and to make connection. you feel young again, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which book are you championing? I'm championing Washington Black by Essie Edugen. All right, thank you, Mark. Next to Mark is your second panelist, and we didn't roll out a red carpet for him today, but we probably should have. He's a journalist from Nipissing First Nation who works at Vogue, and he's the author of the book, The Power of Style. Welcome to Canada Reads, Christian Allaire. Miigwech for having me. All right, well, how are you, Christian? I'm doing good. A little nervous, but excited. <laughs> we can't tell at all. Uh, tell us which book you're championing. I'm proudly championing Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. All right, thank you, Christian. Now, across from me in the Canada Read studio is your third panelist. She's a rising star from Vancouver who's been finding her voice on screen and off. You may have seen her in the Babysitter's Club or Are You Afraid of the Dark? And thanks to her activism, she was named one of 17 magazines Voices of the Year in 2020. Welcome to Canada Reads, Malia Baker. Thank you for having me. It's a to pleasure here. to have you. How are you? I'm good. Like Christian said, a little nervous, but I feel like we're all comforted in that nerves together. Absolutely. And those nerves, will, they'll fade away Natural, exactly. very, very soon. Um, you know, we've always encouraged uh, students, teen readers to participate in Canada Reads. We've had YA books on this show. We've had Canada Reads resources for schools available at curio.ca. And all that means we are very excited to have you at this table. Are you ready to represent your generation? Oh, God, that's terrifying. But yeah, <laughs> sure, I guess, <laughs> representing Gen Z here. Pressure. Challenging question right out of the gate. <laughs> Tell us which book you are championing. I am championing Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez. Very nice, thank you. Next to Malia is my fourth panelist, your fourth panelist, I shouldn't be so protective of you. She is a scientist whose work is rooted in nature. She's a renowned forest ecologist, the author as well of the best-selling book, Finding the Mother Tree. Her work was even mentioned on the TV show, Ted Lasso. Welcome to Canada Read, Suzanne Samard. Thank you for having me here. It's our pleasure. How are you feeling, Suzanne? A bit nervous, but um, I'm really stoked to be in the boreal forest. I don't often get into the boreal forest and Toronto is right on the edge of it. Right, well, and you know, I wanted to ask you about that. Your ecology work, it focuses on a cooperation and, and collaboration in forests. Uh, can you apply any of that to your Canada Reads strategy? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about looking for those nuggets, those nuclei in the forest that, that really help, that, that bind things together. Um, and that's what I look for in all of these books is the, the themes and, and the, the, the you know, the, the things that we learn that connects us all together. Sure. All right, look forward to hearing about it. Tell us which book you're championing. I'm championing Life in the City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Your final panelist is on my right. We have uh, completed the circle. He is an entrepreneur and an activist who wants you to give peace and pieces of his chocolate a chance. <laughs> He's the founder and CEO of the company Peace by Chocolate. His family came to Canada as refugees from Syria. They now call Nova Scotia home. 
Welcome to Canada Reads, Derek Haddad. Thank you so much, Ali. Happy to be here. I'm uh, very happy to have you. Now, uh, let me say this. Um, a little gift or two goes a long way on That's Canada right. Reads. <laughs> Did you bring me chocolate? I got, a lot, actually, I, I got a lot of chocolate for everyone. I kept them in my room just for the last day, so you all don't vote against my book and I you'll get it. I'm not, sure about, uh, I'm not sure about this. I have chocolate for you all thing. I'll speak to you we later about how bribery is supposed to work. To yeah. um, but I'm for now, close to you now Ellie, so. uh, tell us which book you are championing. I am championing the amazing book, What Strange Paradise by Omar al -Akkad. All right. Thank you, Tarek. Well, there you have it. Your Canada Reads 2022 contenders. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, we know the players. It is time to learn the game. Mark, Christian, Malia, Suzanne, and Tarek. We're going to go around the room. We'll play a trailer for each book, and then you'll each get 60 seconds to make your opening arguments. And when your time is up, I'm going to re you know, ring this mighty bell. I'm sure you've heard that a number of times. Yeah. And after your opening statements, it'll be time to debate. And before the day is over, you will cast your very first vote. Now, before we get into things, I do want to let the audience know that uh, all five of the books that we're dealing with have difficult topics. Trauma, racism, war, the climate crisis, and more. And so if any of these subjects are difficult for you, you can head to cbcbooks.ca to find places to get support. Let's be kind to each other and to ourselves. Okay. Mark, you are up first. I understand that. Yay! <laughs> You're championing the novel Washington Black by S.E. Adujin, as you said. Let's check out the trailer. His name is George Washington Black. Wash is a black boy living in slavery bound to a Barbados plantation. An artistic child, Wash has designs on freedom. The hand of fate intervenes. A white man arrives, Christopher Titch Wilde. Titch introduces Wash to a wondrous world of nature and of flying machines. An act of violence sets the wheels in motion for a new life. Powered by hope, by art and by science, Wash flies high above the clouds and sets off for adventure with freedom forever the destination. Mark, you have 60 seconds. Why is Washington Black the one book all of Canada should read? This year, winning is all about connection, and Washington Black connects us in so many ways. Like all five little Indians, Washington is stolen by a white man, and after enduring many horrors, given freedom. But now what? 15-year-old Wash is like nine-year-old Amir in What Strange Paradise, running, fleeing, a bounty on his head. In Life in the City of Dirty Water, Clayton, like Wash, bears witness to eruptive violence and develops a deep connection to the natural world. And like Bing and Scarborough, overcame the challenges and discrimination of a marginalized community to let his talents shine. But Washington Black does something the others don't. It's the one book that takes us beyond the brutal headlines and realities of today and completely transports us to a different time and place. It connects us through a journey of self-discovery to the pure joy and pleasure of losing ourselves in reading that only a contemporary literary classic can do. Thank you. That is your turn. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much. All right, Christian, you are up. You are championing the novel Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Let's play the trailer. Kenny, Lucy, Howie, Maisie, and Clara. Five stolen children, residents of the mission school. Now adults scattered on the seedy streets of Vancouver's downtown east side, haunted by memories, heads shaved, bodies violated, but connected by other memories too, of furtive notes, <laughs> longing glances, secret celebrations. They seek solace and hope in each other's company. Five little Indians searching for home.
Christian 60 seconds are on the clock. Why is Five Little Indians the one book all of Canada should read? Well, history is not history until it's over. Five Little Indians illuminates the living impact of residential schools and the trauma that's resonated through the generations. Through her complex characters, Michelle offers necessary truths that must be faced if Canada's primary relationship, that between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, is to move beyond the oppressor and the oppressed. It's a book rooted in the now. Today, the remains of our stolen children continue to be found across North America. And through her vivid storytelling, Michelle humanizes these children. She gives them a voice, reminds us that they belong to someone. But this isn't just an Indigenous story. Its themes of survival, hope, determination are ones that any reader can connect with. The story acts as a roadmap towards true reconciliation and a renewed relationship that would benefit all Canadians. Miigwech. With four seconds to spare, I'll ring it anyway, just for formality's sake. Thank you very much, Christian. Malia, you're next. You are championing the novel Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez. Let's check out the trailer. We are the kids of Scarborough, a diverse community of the working poor, where the concrete cracks beneath the feet. At school, Miss Hina feeds us, loves us, gives us a safe space to learn, to grow. Laura, the girl lost in a cloud of neglect. Bing, the boy begging for a world without bullies and Sylvie, the girl who makes believe to escape sadness. In Scarborough, where the concrete cracks beneath the feet, we are roses determined to thrive. Malia, you have 60 seconds. Why is Scarborough the one book all of Canada should read? I can't think of a more relevant book for our current climate, but more than anything, we need to see the humanity behind each person so that we can find connection no matter how a person's lived experiences are from our own. Scarborough, Catherine Hernandez's debut novel does just that and more. This one story shows so many people's perspectives in a such a raw and unfiltered way. It's a book that sparks conversations on issues that have plagued this country for far too long leaving us with no doubt about who's considered important in the world and who's disposable. Better yet, we're seeing it through the lenses of three kids who we connect on, son, on such a level that it hurts. It's not only youth of Canada, but a biracial girl from Vancouver. You might be surprised when I tell you I needed this book. It was the medicine that brilliantly broke and warmed my heart from the loss of community, as I'm sure we've all felt for the past couple of years, from my own experiences growing up in this quiet space of underrepresentation. The unpolished authenticity of this book spoke to me. As much as this book is for Scarborough, it's truly a microcosm for Canada as a whole. And as Canada, it's time we listen. Thank you, Malia. Suzanne, it is your turn. You are championing the book, The Memoir, Life in the City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller. Let's roll the trailer. Tan Se, my name is Clayton Thomas Mueller. I'm a member of Puckatawag and Cree Nation. I ended up in Winnipeg because my family was dispossessed from our land. In my language, Winnipeg means murky water, a toxic swirl of gangs, drugs, anger. My healing journey began when I reconnected with nature, with ceremony. I realized everything is connected the urban gangsters to the elders on trap lines, the bleakness of despair to hope. Driven by love and forgiveness, I fight to protect Mother Earth, a warrior in the city of dirty water. Suzanne, 60 seconds are on the clock. Why is Life in the City of Dirty Water the one book all of Canada should read? Canada is at a crossroads. We really are facing an uncertain future because of climate change and all of the intergenerational um, trauma that has brought us to this place. Um, we're at a crossroads because we need to decide whether we want to continue on with oppression 
and exploitation or towards love and healing. And Clayton really does take us there. He talks about his experience growing up Cree in Winnipeg, about the fear, the confusion, the violence, and how his mother um, helped him turn that violence through her stories, through her example, through her lifelong learning of how to become a whole person. And it also came from his, his um, visits to the summer home, the summer trap lines in northern Manitoba, where he was able to connect with his culture and his people. Clayton turned his anger into action. And in his healing journey, he became an activist, a warrior. He learned. That is time. Thank you very much, Suzanne. All right, Derek, you're on my right. And uh, that, is, make, make, that makes you the, the final panelist. You're championing the novel What Strange Paradise by Omar al akkad Here's the trailer. A smuggler's boat of desperate passengers. A storm in the Aegean Sea. Nine-year-old Amir face down in the sand. A sole survivor in a strange paradise. Masked men yell in a language Amir doesn't understand. A local teenaged girl appears. Vanna is kind. She is helpful. She smiles. No language or culture shared between them. But trouble is tracking Amir. Refugees are rounded up. Amir and Vanna hold hands. They run. Eric, you have 60 seconds. Why is What Strange Paradise the one book all of Canada should read? Stories change people, and What Strange Paradise offers that change in the lens of two children trying to find their path in a very chaotic world that fluctuates between cruelty and kindness after a refugee boat crash. And through its universality, it connects to every human being looking for hope and for home. It is also a deeply humanistic fable of empathy and compassion, carelessness, and unvarnished indifference. It is a thought-provoking book that touches on our own fragility and hubris at a time of temporary discourse and crisis fatigue. This quick pace and enlightening tale will resonate with all Canadians trying to help war survivors who, in spite of losing everything, their restlessness and fight for justice never fizzled out during the strain of displacement. Canadians need this book to open our arms and hearts for refugees and to celebrate what Canada is all about. Thank you, Tarek. There you have it, the titles in the running for Canada Reads 2022. They are Washington Black by Essie Adujan, championed by Mark Tewksbury, Five Little Indians by Michelle Good, backed by Christian Allaire, Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez, chosen by Malia Baker, Life in the City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller, backed by Suzanne Samard, and What Strange Paradise by Omar al akkad championed by Tarek Hadhat. There are five books on the table, each of them with the power to connect us. By the end of the week, one will be your winner, but by the end of today, one will be eliminated. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. It is time to debate. <laughs> All right, this year's theme is one book to connect us, as we mentioned, and that theme and this, this idea of connection and community, it plays out differently in each of the five books on, this, on, on these tables. We're experiencing a lot of division in the world right now, and books can speak to issues that we see in the news and experience in our lives. So with that in mind, uh, that we're talking about the books and, and, and not the headlines, I wanna ask this, whether it be in the world in our communities or even within ourselves, which book best bridges the divides we are experiencing? Malia, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. I think I'm gonna go with Scarborough. <laughs> that, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, I felt like it bridges the gaps on whatever perspective you're coming from. I mean, I'm from Vancouver. I'm not from Scarborough. This is, from the title alone, a, a book that targets a specific crowd. And that's what I originally thought going into the book that it was about. Um, but I could not have been more wrong. Like I said, it was a microcosm of Canada as a whole. Um, you can bridge the gaps from the different perspectives that completely realm in this book. We see 
Corey, Laura's father, um, and how he's grown up and how much anger and resentment he holds. Um, and especially channeling that through his daughter, Laura, who's just trying to live her life as this young girl. Um, and I feel like having that one in particular, along with all, the, all these other characters like Sylvie and Bing, there's such different uprisings. And um, with community as a whole, it's one, one body of unified people. And um, this book expertly does that. It's community. And that's what I felt like I was missing, especially with COVID. And a lot of people are able to relate to that and hold on to that and cherish that in the good times and the bad. Kristen, let me go to you. What are your thoughts on um, what Malia said first, that you could respond to that, and then tell me about uh, your response to the same question? Yeah, well, I think Scarborough, like Five Little Indians, is all about finding your community in Canada, finding your group of people who can help you through the goods, the bads. Um, with me, with Scarborough, I don't want to come in hot, but I do have some thoughts, is I thought a few of the characters are a little underdeveloped for me. Um, you know, I think Catherine does such a great job of including as many different cultures and perspectives as possible. But with some characters, I didn't get a full story, especially someone like Sylvie, who is, you know, indigenous and her mother, and maybe I'm biased in that way, but I wanted so much more from her in, in that story. Um, whereas with Five Little Indians, you know, I really feel like Michelle gave owned it on five characters and really gave them a full scope. They could each be their own movie. Um, and I just felt like with Scarborough, I, I maybe lacked that a little bit. OK, we've watched The Devil Wears Prada. They, they come in hot uh, in that industry. <laughs> I'm thought, not Miranda Priestly. you might. No, not everyone. <laughs> uh, Suzanne, what are your thoughts on this? Which book best uh, bridges the divides that we're experiencing? Well, of course, I'm going, I'm championing life in the city of dirty water, so I'm going to argue for that. The one thing that, that Clayton is able to do is he connects the past with the future. Um, and I think that that's what sets, sets it apart from all the other books. We have an uncertain future ahead of us, and he really takes what he's learned from his past, his culture, his spirituality, his, his ancestors, and all those stories of of creation and spirituality that, that make us a whole community, make, makes the First Nations and all the people of Canada whole. And it's that wholeness that's going to bring us forward. And so I feel like Life in the City of Dirty Water really was able to, to do that better than any other book. It really shows us a pathway forward as we try to deal with upcoming traumas that are undoubtedly going to happen as climate changes. I felt like Five Little, Little Indians really gave us a wonderful view of, um, of, of what, you know, intergener or what the trauma of the residential schools was. It was shocking, um, um, but it didn't go really beyond their lives um, to the moment. I mean, they had the moments of healing as young, as young adults, um, but didn't go beyond how that could um, help all of us in Canada. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that Clayton's book really did that. Mark, let me ask you, what is your, uh, well, actually, it, it, we'll, and we'll get to you, Christian, because your, your book is in the microscope, uh, under the microscope at this point. But Mark, I want to ask you what your thoughts on, our, on Suzanne's assessment of life in the city of Dirty Water and uh, your own book. Yeah, I think Suzanne, you did a really good job. I think it's true. Clayton is the, the Clayton's book puts us most to the future, for sure, because it's a memoir. And, and funny, I feel a real synergy between the character of Washington Black and Clayton. They're both on a, on a real journey of self-discovery. In fact, all of our books start from some serious childhood trauma mm -hmm. and are kind of working our way to home or freedom or peace or whatever that might be. I think that what makes Washington Black um, uniquely positioned for right now is that all of these issues are so important. The environment, refugee crises, residential schools, our marginalized communities. In order to care for those issues, we have to first connect to our own humanity. And what my book does is it takes you through one character, through different settings and times so deeply that we lose ourselves in that character. And you're either going to see the world as Washington sees it, or you're gonna see how the world sees Washington. And one way or the other, you're gonna be deeply affected and connected by that. Christian, what is your uh, assessment originally of what uh, Suzanne uh, was saying about Yes. Your book and, and about... Yes, I have some thoughts. Um, <laughs> no, I think, you know, residential schools are often cited in a historical context, and that can make it very difficult for Canadians to, A, read about it and B, understand it. I think Michelle humanized the experience by giving them five unique voices. And, um, you know, you, you say 
that we we don't get to move past their trauma. I think that's the whole book is it's in fact not even rooted in their experiences in the school. It's all about the aftermath and them working through that trauma and finding community in each other to do that. And, you know, I think of the theme, one book to connect us. I mean, this country is built on the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And, you know, to, to have truth and reconciliation, we need the truth. And that's what Michelle is doing for once. We haven't been afforded the true perspectives of what happened. And I feel like this book does that. Tarek, I'd like to get your voice in here. What, uh, oh. what book best bridges the, the divides that we're experiencing and how does it do it? The book on top of your stack there. <laughs> I mean, that just what happens to be paradise? there. Let me just say <laughs> that. That just happens to be there. It's, uh, I wanted to symmetry. point that out, but uh, I truly believe in what Strange Paradise. I'm very passionate about that cause. Not for the sake for me of being here. I'm playing the newcomer card on the table, but I'm surely now a Canadian by heart and by mind and by, by soul. What Strange Paradise really connects all the dots that everyone was really touching on which is no one can go back and start a new beginning, but everyone can start today and make a new ending. And that's why refugees left their homelands to try to find peace, which is really I'm advocating for in my day-to-day -day life now. I'm speaking about a story that, uh, that, that touches my heart. Amir is a nine-year-old child, 21 uh, years younger than me, but I'm truly speaking to Canadians on the values that the relevance of this story to brings us to the real meaning of humanity by supporting and caring for each other and caring about human beings on the other side of the world. Although Canadians sometimes say they are too far, they are on the other side of the world. Why should we, why should we spend our attention on them? Why should we, shouldn't we care about issues that matter to us as Canadians? But we cannot move forward as Canadians without caring about humanity because we are living in a, in a time when the world is so interconnected when a crisis is happening in Syria, it's affecting us in Canada. When a crisis is happening in Ukraine, we go to our homes every night and watch the news. This is what we are seeing. And Canadians need to see that hope throughout this lovely community movement because throughout love and kindness, we connect and bond much more than anything else. And that's why I really feel that What Strange Paradise is such a powerful novel to bring and shed a light on this important topic. Aliyah, let me ask you, what are your thoughts on what uh, Tarek is saying? Yeah, I think you spoke perfectly about the topic and um, how it should be told and how it must be told, you know? Exactly like you said, we see things on the news when we come home and we watch it and we pay attention. Um, but I felt like there's a lot of things in the actual storytelling of the book, not to come in hot, <laughs> but the actual storytelling of the book that didn't exactly align with me as a reader. Um, I felt like the non-linear storytelling of it and having those before and um, after scenes, I loved the concept and I loved the thought of it, but the way it was executed made me feel like I had to go back a little bit. I had to backtrack. And when I put the book down, as we all are living life, and we don't have time to read a book straight through right away um, and picked it back up, um, I didn't exactly get enough. I wanted more of Amir's thoughts and experiences. I felt like if we're going to go through the before and after scenes, um, it should have been done, not should have, it could have been done in a way that's first person so that we're able to hear more of those thoughts. Um, because naming Vanna and Amir as the protagonists, but hearing more of the Colonel's story inside throughout the end and throughout the whole me meeting of him, I just felt like I learned more about him than throughout these characters that I so desperately wanted to connect with. Um, and those before and after scenes, it didn't exactly take anything up for me. I felt like it didn't really add anything that I wanted it to add that would have added a different layer. And I wanted that to happen, but it just it didn't. Well, let's get a response from you on that, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the structure, before even I connected to the book on a deeper level, I just thought that this is the Old Testament, New Testament style that the author wanted to communicate something to us. And uh, I knew as well, for me, being passionate so much about this book, um, I, I got so immersed in it, actually, and that generated much more interest for me mm. in the before and the after. You know, I... I'm really happy that the author chose this narrative instead of doing us flashbacks when he's telling a story in a linear way, mm. because in this way, it just generated much more excitement for me. Mm. Um, and within every chapter, then, you would be op opening a huge amount of infinite possibilities about what the next chapter is going to tell you. Mm. And this is really the beauty of a book. It's not like a movie, because in a movie, you have the music that sets you up to, to expect what's going to happen next. In this book specifically, the author 
intentionally. They don't want us to know what's going to happen next. And that's really what, what I felt throughout the before and the after uh, chapters. It's, it certainly is going to tell us a story uh, that we need to reflect more each time we flip to the next chapter on the reasons and the causes that really had pushed Amir and his family to leave their homelands in the first place. Tarek and all our panelists, that is it for that round. Thank you. Okay. Well, Canada Reads is a long, intense week, and I know you've all been prepping very hard, and that has probably taken a toll. So we ask those who know the books best to give you a little pep talk. Mm. Let's listen to this. Malia, you are unstoppable. You're a powerhouse, period, the end. And I know that when you get into that ring with my book in hand, that everything that is gonna come out of your mouth is gonna be said with absolute confidence, and I'm gonna be on the sidelines cheering you on. Dr. Samard, continue to listen to whatever that voice is that connected to life in the city of dirty water, to listen to that voice and to speak with truth, you know, and to do it in a way that is strong. Mark, it's very clear to me that you read the book really deeply and intensely and, and you know everything you need to know about it and just do your magic. <laughs> I would put my hand on his shoulder and I would tell him, Christian, you have the truth, here is the truth. Be in the truth, be honorable, be respectful, be the best you can be and the best will be the outcome. Tarek, um, I've been asked to give you a pep talk and I have almost nothing of use to offer you. This thing is gonna go sideways in a hurry. You are a far more charming and eloquent human being than I am. So essentially, whatever you come up against, just think of what I would do in that situation. Do the exact opposite, and we're gonna ride this thing on out. Good luck. Those are the voices of this year's Canada Reads authors, Catherine Hernandez, Clayton Thomas Mueller, Essie Adujan, Michelle Good and Omar El Akkad. I felt like I could climb a mountain, and then Omar came in and That's went, right. I'm climb a mountain. Just relax. Just take it easy. Uh, we know Omar very well on this show, and this, that's, that's, he's on brand there. <laughs> I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. Right. Each of these books explores big ideas, big themes, big systemic issues, but they also showcase the power of small, intimate moments and, and how these moments can go on to have a big impact. So I'm going to ask you which book other than your own does the best job of showing how a small act can be the start of something big. I heard your exasperated groan there, Mark. Um, <laughs> I was all ready for mine. I, of course, of course, and there will be time for that. But other than your own, which book does the best job of showcasing or, or showing how a small act can be the start of something So I'm big? just having to trust that things are gonna come in the moment as we're here. And I, I just think of a scene from Scarborough with Miss Hina, where she's helping Sylvie come to terms with understanding she needs some help with Johnny. She needs some support. And then when they find a way to communicate with Johnny in his own language, it, it just, it, it brought me to tears. I thought that very small act of intimacy was really, really impactful. All right, very nice. Uh, uh, Suzanne, let me ask you. Yeah, I, you know, I really loved Paradise and the writing was so beautiful. And there were so many moments in that book um, that were so heartful. You, you know, it was so much in the present, um, on the boat. You just felt the pain of the people, but the, the, the joy and the humanity of all of the people, even, you know, even the criminal who was taking them off on this migrant ship. Mohammed. Um, Mohammed. Yeah. But the, the one moment that, that really, um, that I really loved was, was when Omar Ibrahim, the, the pregnant woman who was looking after Amr on that boat, <laughs> she looked after him in all these small ways. And I remember the one moment when he really had to go pee and, um, and she helped him to go pee over the edge of the, of the boat. And he was so shy, you know, he's only like nine years old, but he was so shy about, you know, about people being able to see and she got, you know, 
got the men to put their jackets up so that he could they couldn't see and and then he peed all over the place but but that was such a moment of humanity and here she was eight months pregnant um and yet you know she had that very intimate caring moment with that little boy and i just thought wow that that was so heartful and it really brought us into the minds and the humanity of the refugees mm. malia let me ask you the same question yeah i'm gonna have to say five little indians there's some moments in there throughout the heartbreak that you find really heartwarming moments i think one of those moments for me was um clara and her getting john lennon i thought that was such a key moment and i was like yes I think we can all understand that and relate to that on such a deep level with dogs in particular. Um, but she said, I forgot exactly what she said. She was just, that's the only human or person or being that's really loved me. And I think that just moved me a little bit and I would have to point that one out for sure. All right, Christian, how about you? Well, I, this is working out, but I actually had Washington Black. Um, there was a really, I love the intimacy of him and his drawing. Um, it's kind of used in a really clever way almost to move the story forward. You know, he has this clear talent from the get-go and throughout the book, his talent's improving and through his love of drawing, he meets, you know, his first love interest. And I just thought it was such a nice little detail that grew to be something special in its own little story. I thought it was, I really loved that you part of it. it. You yeah. got it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like his, his act of self-will when yes. he picks up the drawing, right? Mm -hmm. It's a step towards freedom. Thank you for noticing that. Mm -hmm. Derek. Uh, well, I perfectly worked out actually because I truly loved what Clayton had to say about his connection to the people around him in general, everyone who he, who he interacted with. He described it perfectly with such, you know, close relationships that he was able to build within each movement that he had to make, starting with his mother, mm -hmm. to the friends, to each conference he attended, building on the noble values that bring human beings together of compassion, empathy, and certainly caring, you know. And I, I felt that Clayton certainly communicated that really well. Uh, you know, it was a, a memoir, the only memoir on the, on the table, but I truly believe that Clayton has done absolutely phenomenal job communicating that, you know, from heart to heart. I know these moments sometimes can be really difficult to, to um, connect to the reader throughout, you know, a book because you cannot see, but he described every incident that he had with each one of those people he, he encountered uh, with absolute uh, a beauty. And the moment that he uh, certainly brought this to us, I, I truly felt it. Um, in, in my heart. So I'm thankful for the Clayton that he brought this to us. Well, this has turned into quite the love fest. This <laughs> <Yes>. round. <laughs> so so that was what so we had. Far. So enjoy it. No, enjoy That's it right. while it's here. Absolutely. <laughs> Suzanne, let me ask you, which book surprised you the most? Um, I think Five Little Indians. You know, I, I absolutely adored that book. And um, for me, it just brought home, you know, things that I... I had heard and, under, and thought I understood, but not in that really painful, intimate way. Um, I think, you know, as non, a non-Indigenous person, we're, you know, we, we, we don't, we're not fully aware of, of the trauma of the genocide that has happened in Canada. And, you know, it was so painful and so graphic. And, and I think the other part that was so surprising is that that each character took that pain and trauma and they made it their own and they were resilient, right? Even Maisie, who took her own life in the end, she took control of her life, right? Um, even Kenny, who, who died of alcoholism, he was trying with everything he could to bring his life together. And Clara, I mean, with the clarity that she had, um, to move forward and I mean all of them were just brilliantly resilient and and so I think for me it was it was the trauma and then the rebounding and the resilience that was so deep it was such a deep emotion for me to read that book. Thank you Suzanne also with a, a reminder that there will be spoilers on this show uh, <laughs> where there's no avoiding that. Uh, Tarek let me ask you which book surprised you the most? Um, surprised me in a good way Scarborough actually uh, it was incredible, to be honest, to see the, the deep connection between Miss Hina and Laura at so many incidents, you know, when, when she was helping her out in spite of, you know, uh, her a racist father, you know, who tried to uh, certainly have negative impact on her. So um, I was not expecting that at all, actually, and I was not expecting that warmth 
uh, that uh, uh, actually Catherine has introduced us to in, in that book and the connection that Tina uh, kept and the patience that Tina kept while she was uh, humiliated in many emails from her supervisor until the end. Uh, that was certainly surprising. I certainly expected her to give up, but she did not. And that was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Christian, let me ask you, which book surprised you? I think What Strange Paradise actually surprised me the most. Um, you know, I think the, the whole concept of giving, you know, refugee people in Canada a voice and making you, so you have to care about it. You know, I, I am certainly a victim of seeing something on the news and just not even, you know, listening. I think we're all guilty of that in any way. Um, but this book made me think of all of the refugees here in Canada who each have their story, like Amir. Each one comes with a story. And, um, you know, I don't think a book has ever done that in a way where I think all these books, what they've done so well is, I keep saying this word humanize, but I think the best way to understand someone else's experience is to give it a human connection. And this is exactly what that book did for me. So mm. I thought it was a great book. Malia, how about you? What book surprised you? I'm gonna have to say Washington Black. I was surprised from the start. The first chapter pulled me in right away and I was so keen and so focused and so intrigued with everything that was happening. You immediately connected to Wash and you could feel what he was feeling. You could feel everything, especially towards Big Kit, you know? We had that connection and that really pulled me in. Um, but while I got th further throughout the book, there was almost this like fantasy-like feeling of it um, and the feeling, like you said, Said, humanize, humanizing it and so to that point I was just very taken aback and surprised in the best way possible because I'm so tired of especially black voices used as a trauma story to go throughout all the motions and try to get everything out especially speaking on a topic such as slavery I thought it was done in a way that brought light and brought this sort of excitement and I, I loved that. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Mark, um, with the minute we have left, let's sure. say, let, let's well, ask I'm you the same question. I'm going to say what strange paradise, and, and I'm going to say it, and, and I was surprised at its cynicism at the end. Mm -hmm. I was really, and, and we need to talk about that because I, I really, I enjoyed the book so much. I love the tension, the writing. Omar's a journalist, so it's super dynamic. I like the before and after. I just felt really, really hurt at the end. Very, oh, very uh, uh, hurt. Well, let's almost give ripped Derek, off, uh, I would a, say. A, a, a quick uh, half a minute to respond to that. Then. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I expected that. I expected everyone was like, you know, even when you Google what's strange parallel, it's like, what's the ending? So I um, truly uh, appreciate that Umar kept that open ending for all of us, really, to, for our imagination. And that's so powerful, you know. All the other books probably had very... Uh, finite ending that, you Mine know, doesn't. finish all of those Mine characters. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I truly believe that Omar has done absolutely phenomenal work throughout this book to tell us a story that uh, takes much more than one option as right or wrong. And that's the whole book. Uh, that's the message of the whole book is really I what do we see right and what do we see, do we see wrong, which is relative. That is it for this round. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Mark literally sitting on his hand yeah. to yeah. stop himself from... <laughs> gesticulating and talking. Um, <laughs> panelists, we're almost at the end of day one. Oh wow. my God. And that means it it's fast. almost time for our very first elimination. Not just yet. I do want to give you all a chance to respond to what's been said today. A final word before we head into the vote. So I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to make one final argument. We'll go around the table in the same order we did at the beginning of the show, which means, Mark, you're going to be up first. Your final word. 30 seconds are on the clock. Sure. Well, I think what's interesting, um, Malia kind of mentioned that it, it's almost fantastical parts of the book of Washington Black, but what it is is Essie's mimic the conventions of the 19th century novel. And so we're allowed to have characters reemerge and coincidences happen. That's just a classic uh, storytelling device. But through that, she's actually made literature so accessible and this character of Washington Black so real. I'm not a black man, obviously. I'm not a black person. But thanks to Essie's incredibly descriptive writing, I was able to have that experience through this character of Washington Black. Thank you, Mark. Christian, it's time for your last word. 30 seconds are on the clock. 
Well, I mean, this book is just, it's the right book for this time. You know, over the past year, we've seen the headlines of the countless stolen bodies that we're digging up across America. I couldn't think of a book that's more timely that addresses it. You know, we as Canadians, like I said, have a treaty responsibility to understand our Indigenous people here in Canada and not just understand them, but empathize with them and help them move forward. And we haven't done that in this country yet. And, you know, the, the book allows that better understanding and that support so we can move forward as a country. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> and the book you are referring to, obviously, for those tuning in or listening, is Five Little Indians yes. by Michelle Good. Malia, you have 30 seconds for your final words. I'm just going to push community, you know, a unified body of individuals. That's the literal definition, and I feel like Scarborough does that in such an excellent way. Um, whether we're seeing Laura look through the window to see the woman smoking on her daily daily dues, and then we see uh, another perspective of the woman looking back at Laura, it's that obliviousness of relying on someone. And that is community to me. Whether you know it or not, someone is looking out for you. Someone is relying on you. Um, and then we hear that the woman is the one that breaks the news. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. <laughs> felt you, felt you ramping up. I know. <laughs> Suzanne, it is your turn. You have 30 seconds. Life in the City of the Dirty Water really is the book of our times because we are facing um, a, an uncertain future. And in order to do this, we need to dig into our community and in, into our past and into all the stories of our spirituality, our culture, and the First Nations culture that Clayton brings to life, the Sundance, for example, the healing that's associated with the sense of community, uh, the culture that, that really gives us the wisdom and the sacred knowledge of how to move forward. Thank you, Suzanne. Tarek, one last chance. Persuade the panel, 30 seconds are on the clock. One book to connect us, What Strange Paradise is the book that all of Canada must read today, yesterday, tomorrow, in the future. I truly believe in the cause. I'm not talking and making stuff up. I'm talking about my own story that I saw in this book. And I truly believe that Canadians are watching millions of emirs on the news these days. So I hope that everyone can reconsider their sense of home, humanity, identity and belonging and we should not take for granted any of those because I truly believe we all have the chance to uh, reconsider our sense of home and despair. Thank you, Tarek. Okay, panelists, that is it for today's debate. The time is here. Time to vote. You have your ballots in front of you. Please mark an X beside the book that you want to eliminate from the competition. Once you have voted, Winnie from the Canada Reads team will take your ballot. And I do want to remind you all that there are no secret ballots on Canada Reads. Which title will be the first to go? Will it be Washington Black by Essie Idujan? Mark Tewksbury is championing that novel. Will it be Five Little Indians by Michelle Good? This book was chosen by Christian Nallaire. Lippy Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez. Malia Baker is backing that title. Will it be Life in the City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller? That memoir is being championed by Suzanne Simard. Or will it be What Strange Paradise by Omar El Akkad? That book selected by Tarek Haddad. Well, I did notice that um, there, was a, there was a swiftness to some of the voting. I did notice that some of you knew immediately Mark and Christian, you were quick with that, uh, with, with that pen. Uh, Tarek, I think you were a little more, I thought you took some it. time, yeah. a little more thoughtful. I changed my mind four times. Wow. <laughs> I Over think, the past three I days. will say that the general <laughs> vibe in the room prior to voting and throughout voting is somewhat of a stunned shock. That's right. That it came to this as quickly as it did. And, uh, and I think regardless of how much you watch previous Canada Reads and prepare, no matter what, this is always very quick. Thank you, Winnie. I have the results, I have the ballots in hand. So, Malia Baker, let's start with you. How did you vote? I voted for Life in the City of Dirty Water. Okay, so we have one vote against Life in the City of Dirty Water. Suzanne Smart, how did you vote? This was really, really hard to decide, but I voted for Washington Black. 
I know. I'm so sorry, Mark. I'm <laughs> Mark, so sorry. absolutely I dumbfounded, the book. shocked. And when we say for, of course, we mean against. You voted to uh, eliminate Washington Black from Canada Reads. Kristen Lair, how did you vote? I voted against Scarborough. Okay. Three different votes, three different panelists. One vote against Life in the City of Dirty Water, one against Smart Washington Black, and now one against Scarborough. Mark Tewksbury, how did you vote? <laughs> I voted What Strange Paradise. And we have a vote against What Strange Paradise. That is four people with four different vo votes. The, uh, the result sort of lies in your hand. <laughs> Wow. Tarek, how did you vote? Um, I loved all the books, so I am so sorry, but I just felt among all the mix, I just voted against Life in the City of Dirty Water. And with that, <laughs> Life in the City of Dirty Water is eliminated. <laughs> all right, we have a few minutes and I would be remiss not to turn to you, Suzanne, in this moment. Um, I listened to your interview with Clayton Thomas Mueller. I know exactly how passionate you are about his work, his life, this book, and your own connections to it. I'll give you a minute to just uh, perhaps say something about the book or something to Clayton. Yeah, you know, this is, a, I hope that people read Life in the City of Dirty Water. It's, um, it's such a heartful book. It's such a, a book of reflection, of growing, of, of learning from, from our past mistakes as a nation and what we need to do as a nation going forward. You know, in my own work, I've, I've also gone through a healing process like, like, it's not exactly the same, obviously, of Clayton, but of how you really need to dig into yourself in order to do healing work for the land. Um, and, you know, this is not easy stuff to do and to write about it from your heart um, with all your community around you. You know, his mother was such a strong presence in the book. Um, obviously, she gave him a great deal of wisdom and, um, and strength to move forward. And I think that there is so much story in here um, for all of us, really, or for me anyway, that I learned from you know, about resilience and that resilience, it's not just a one person and one generation thing. It's something that goes on and on and on. And because we've had multi-generations of, tra of trauma, intergenerational trauma, it's gonna take a long time. And it's gonna take a lot of community and connection to do that. And, and I think Clayton gives us a big boost up on, on doing that, you know, that this is how you, this is how it's done. Um, and it's not easy and it takes all the stories and all the people and all of Canada to really move us into the into ne the next thing coming forward. So really it's it's a real it's a real gift. It's a real healing story and and I encourage everybody to read this book. Thank you, Suzanne. I got a man crush on Clayton. What's it? I got a man crush, man on, crush Clayton. on Clayton. I really and do. And I'm sure, you know, many people who have read the story do. I will say this, just in the last minute that we have. Suzanne, you are now what we call a free agent on Canada Reads. Um, you know, normally I would think Mark is going to be quite uh, vengeful against you, but in the end, uh, he can't <laughs> vote you off. But now you have she some has, power. She has redemption now. Yeah. She can <laughs> redeem herself. You have some power here, and people will be wooing you this week. This is maybe where your chocolates come in That's handy. That's right. Yeah, they may have to <laughs> present themselves earlier uh, than you anticipated, Tarek. Um, but as a free agent, you wield the power to sort of vote in any way. You have the most open ears and the most open mind, and um, we'll be looking forward to that. All right, that is a goodbye to Life in the City of Dirty Water. There are four books left. We have three votes and three eliminations to go. By the end of the week, there will be one title left and it will be the one book that all of Canada should read. I wanna thank you all for your preparedness and your thoughtfulness and your open-mindedness today. It made for a wonderful day one. I'm Ali Hassan, we'll see you again tomorrow. Until then, read on Canada. <laughs>
stuck around, and that is because we have something extra for you, a little Canada Reads after show, and we're going to talk about what went down today. Uh, I, I would... Uh, I would consider that a, a pretty interesting day one. Based on what was said around the table and how the voting went in the end, I'm not sure that was, uh, that was you know, anyone was really predicting that. I know that, you know, Suzanne, you're obviously... Uh, I'd like to give you a moment to sort of process rather than sort of come in and, and ask you more questions about uh, how you're feeling. And I, I think you did summarize quite well, you know, where, what you're feeling, what this book meant to you and what it should mean to uh, Canadians. And uh, I wanted to talk to the two people who voted against life in the city of water. Tarek, you were one of them, and no, um, Malia was the other one. Malia, what were your thoughts there? My thoughts were, I think the Clayton has so many stories. Like, I genuinely, it was so much. And I knew that going into it. I read the little summary beforehand, and I was prepared. But at moments, I had to remind myself that this was a memoir about healing. Um, and I think between it just flipping back and having to kind of backtrack and reread as a point of context and um, throughout that first chapter trying to understand and piece everything together, but then it later connects later on, um, I just felt like people won't give it the chance. And as much as I wish they could, especially from an activist lens as well, I loved that second part. I was writing notes down myself. I was like, yes, all right, following in his footsteps. But I just don't think people are going to be able to give it that chance and give it that piece of love that it comes from a certain perspective. But I respect it, and I respect him so incredibly, and you so incredibly. So. Yeah, it's really all I have to say about it. Sure. Tarek, how about you? Let me uh, as you I mentioned, you know, it was really difficult for me because I kept changing my, my ranks. We saw know, that. Uh, yeah. on, on Friday. So <laughs> what happened is certainly when I was thinking about the other books that I want to hear uh, about in the next few days, that's why really I voted against Life in the City of Dirty Water. I just felt as well, it was kind of a narrative resume at yeah. some point, you know? Like, when, when Clayton is an amazing human being, I absolutely love what he is doing. I love his activism. But, you know, at some point, I, I didn't have to know about all the conferences and the names and the organizations. That was certainly the down point for me. But it is, overall, an incredible book. And I really hope all Canadians should read. What are your thoughts on that, Suzanne, this idea that it's, uh, it reads, uh, some of it anyway, reads like a, a resume? Yeah, you know, I mean, though, though I think that you know, it is a memoir, and so memoirs have those elements to them. You know, they're, they're, they tend to be fairly linear and go through the life story. And, I, and whereas the, f the fiction works that all the other books are, um, there is more, you know, it's, it's a more natural fit for storytelling. Um, and I think, but I, I, you know, I think that, you know, as Clayton becomes more... Uh, practiced at writing that the stories will become fuller and the characters more fully developed it's all there you can mm -hmm. tell there's rich rich characters in there um, and and I, I'm looking forward to his next one because mm -hmm. I think he really will get that and really develop his his story more completely as a memoir writer I was so inspired by how honest and raw he was yeah. in the first part it made me if I ever write a memoir Clayton will have made a big impression on how to really put it out there in, in an honest way. It was very, very moving, that part. Yeah. Mark, let me talk about the way you, you did vote in the end, which was against uh, What Strange Paradise. You alluded to this earlier. There's a cynicism at the end. Is there more to your voting? That was really it. Just I mm -hmm. feel like right now what needs to connect us is hope. And, and by nature, journalists can be cynical. That's you know, it's kind of part of... So it's not a criticism at all. Um, it's did also you feel the only dark? It's only... The, the only book also has no setting in Canada whatsoever. Right. So that was also a bit of a factor for me. I like that all of our boots are, books are rooted somehow in, in the, the setting of the country itself. So those right. two elements. But I mean, I think it, it was one of the best written books for me. It was so beautiful. Obviously a Giller Prize winner. Right. I'm so glad millions of people had read it and continue to read it. Um, yeah. Okay. We I'll have just over a, a minute uh, left here. Uh, <laughs> we have just a minute left. Christian, I wanted to ask you your, um, your thoughts. You voted against Scarborough. But I also wanted to know your thoughts about life in the city of dirty water. Yeah, well, I just hope people take away from that book the importance of Indigenous teachings and their tie to the planet. You know, we're kind of the, the original environmental activists. 
And I think, you know, I, I am sad to see the book go because I think it did a beautiful job at showing why that relationship between man and, and the environment is so important. And to do that through the lens of his culture and sort of a spiritual awakening in himself, I thought was so beautiful. So I'm sad for you. I am. Well, I think... Um... Sadness and apologies are part and parcel <laughs> of what uh, Canada Reads is about, and not because it's part of the Canadian identity, but because it's, you know, it, as it says, it does. It, you, it reads like a resume, life in the city of dirty water, but it's still a man's work and passion and story, and and I think all of you have that, you know, in, in your heart. An You're extraordinary like, man. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that is a wrap on Canada Reads today. I want to say thanks to our panelists, Mark, Christian, Malia, Suzanne, and Tarek. I'll see you then. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads.